Let's get into our study. We're in Psalm 96. We're going to be looking at Psalm 96, hopefully up to Psalm 98 this evening. We'll see. Uh, I for sure will do Psalm 96. How's that sound? Beginning at verse 1, Psalm 96, reading to verse 13, the psalmist writes, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all peoples. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give to the Lord, O kindreds of the peoples. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him, all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world also is firmly established. It shall not be moved. He shall judge the peoples righteously. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar in all its fullness. Let the field be joyful in all that is in it. Then all the trees of the woods will rejoice before the Lord, for he's coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. So this is a psalm, and as you look at it, that calls all of God's creation to praise the Lord. Notice he speaks concerning the heavens. He speaks of the earth. He speaks of the sea, the fields, the trees. All of those are called upon to praise the Lord. Not only is creation in the sense of, the, of what he has created in the earth and all, but also all kindreds. That word kindred speaks of clans or families. It speaks of tribes. It speaks of people. And so he's saying not only is the earth, the sea, the field, the trees uh, to praise the Lord, but, but all the people that he has created are, are intended to, to praise him also. Now, somebody might ask, uh, even as we read that, well, why should I? Why should I praise the Lord? Why should all creation give praise to God? Why does this psalmist insist on telling us that we should sing to the Lord a new song, that we should sing to the Lord all the earth and bless his name? Why is that? Well, the reason that we are called to praise the Lord is because he saves, because he is glorious, because he does wonders, because he's awesome, because he's alive, because he has created all things and is filled with glory and majesty. We're called to praise him because he is powerful, he is beautiful, he is holy, and he reigns over a created order that is stable, secure, and enduring. All creation has been called to praise the Lord because he is righteous and because he's coming to judge the earth with righteousness and with truth. And that's the reason that the psalmist gives to us that we are to sing a new song to him and to praise him. Notice he speaks of, uh, of all people praising the Lord. So we know that of all people on the face of the earth, Christians should be the most thankful for what God has done. Of all people who live, we believers should be the, the least likely to be complaining and the most likely to be praising because God has done wonderful things for us, because God has saved us, because God has blessed us, because God has cared for us, and because God is worthy to be praised. Now, tomorrow, this nation is going to go through the motion of having a Thanksgiving uh, celebration. And uh, unfortunately, in our day, uh, that message of being thankful to God has been lost on, on numbers of people. I mean, there are already reports of road rage. Now, imagine that. People are getting mad at one another as they're driving to go give thanks to God for the blessings. It kind of reminds me of church. But that's what's taking place right now. There are people upset. And tomorrow, even tonight, we know, some of us used to do this. Tonight, perhaps tomorrow for sure, there are going to be people who are overeating and overdrinking. And uh, in some homes, it's going to be anything but a place of praise and, and gratitude. In some homes, it's going to be a battlefield tomorrow. But of all people, we Christians really ought to be the ones who are, are so thankful and, and so filled with praise for what God has done. Uh, I was reading something just today about George Washington, and, and this is something that the first president of the United States said uh, as he was um, 
setting his signature to the first day of thanks for the liberties that have been enshrined in our new Constitution. This is what George Washington wrote. He said, whereas it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey His will, to be grateful for His benefits, and humbly to implore His protection and favor. Now, therefore, I do recommend and assign Thursday, the 26th day of November next, to be devoted by the people of these states to the service of that great and glorious being who is the beneficent author of all the good that was, that is, or that will be, that we may then all unite in rendering unto him our sincere and humble thanks for his kind care and protection of the people of this country previous to their becoming a nation, for the signal and manifold mercies and the favorable interpositions of his providence in the course and conclusion of the late war, and also that we may then unite in most humbly offering our prayers and supplications to the great Lord and ruler of nations, and beseech him to pardon our national and other transgressions, and to render our national government a blessing to all the people by constantly being a government of wise, just, and constitutional laws, discreetly and faithfully executed and obeyed. Now, if he wrote that today, he'd be sued by the ACLU. Think about that. But that is the origin of this nation. Uh, that is the mindset of those who, who began this great nation, this great, wonderful nation that we have opportunity to render thanks unto God tomorrow in. You know, George Bush, George W. Bush said, in want or in plenty, in times of challenge or times of calm, we always have reasons to be thankful. America is a land of abundance, prosperity, and hope. This Thanksgiving, we again give thanks for all of our blessings and for the freedoms we enjoy every day. Our, found, our founders thanked the Almighty and humbly sought His wisdom and blessing. May we always live by the same trust, and may God continue to watch over and bless this United States of America. And so, we of all people should be most grateful and thankful. And so, as we look at this psalm, Psalm 96, that's what He's calling us to. He's calling us to sing a new song. I want you to notice in verses 1 and 2 that uh, three times within those first two verses, all the earth is called to sing to the Lord a new song. All the earth is called to sing, to bless, to proclaim and declare His name, salvation, and glory. And this new song that we have been called to sing is really the song of the redeemed. It's the new song that God gives to us because we've been saved. The Bible in Psalm 33, verse 3 says, Sing to him a new song, play skillfully with a shout of joy. So we thank God. We sing a new song to him, according to what the psalmist is saying, because he has saved us. And this is what moves us, by the way, to declare his name. When he says in verse 3, Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all the people, it's because God has saved us and has blessed us that motivates us, empowers us to go out and share with other people what God has done. We're not forced to do that. We're not forced to go out there and, and try and win as many people as we can to our way of thinking. We don't have some kind of guilt system where if you don't stand on a street corner with a magazine or ride your bike somewhere and, and do something, you're not going to get into heaven. We speak about the Lord Jesus Christ because we can't help but do that, because we love the Lord because God has done wonderful things on our behalf, and it just comes out of us, because out of the abundance of our heart, our mouth is going to speak. And so the Lord has done tremendous things for us, and it's easy to speak about Him. It's easy to talk about Him, to declare His name before people. You see, that knowledge that God has saved us is what has propelled the uh, ministry of the church from its inception. The knowledge that our sins have been forgiven, the knowledge that God has, has done a work in my life, uh, the, the knowledge that God has, has written my name in a book and that I'm going to heaven and all my sins have been forgiven, that knowledge has spurred me on to speak about the Lord Jesus Christ, not to try and gain entrance into heaven by good works, but performing those works because I have entrance into heaven, you see. And so that's what motivates us, and that's what ought to motivate you. If the Lord has done something in your life, if God has forgiven you of your sins, if you know for sure you're going to heaven, well, there's just something about that knowledge that motivates you to talk to other people 
And it's a natural thing to do. It's an easy thing to do. You know, I, I, I find myself talking about the things that, that mean the most to me, and I do it very easily. You know, as a grandfather, I, I have no problem boring you with stories about Josiah. As, as a father, I've never even thought that you might not want to hear stories about my four children, never even considered that you might hate every one of them. I, I have never thought about that. And I've never thought, for those of you who are members of my church, I've never thought a second about, about using uh, illustrations from my relationship with my wife, Marie. I've never thought a thing about that because those things just spill out of my heart because those are the things that are most dear to me. So it's easy to speak about those things. They just come naturally. Well, I've discovered that talking about Jesus is, is really basically the same thing. If you have a relationship with the Lord, if you enjoy fellowship with Him, if you know that He has saved you and, and He's blessing you, it's easy to talk about the Lord with people. It's not that difficult. Now, sometimes you might think, oh, I don't know what I'm going to say. I don't know how I'm going to say this. You'll be speaking to somebody and you're looking at them and suddenly their face changes into the face of the devil and you are so afraid of offending them. I've discovered if you just have a natural conversation, very often the, the Lord opens doors for you to talk and to share the little bit that he might give you opportunity to share. It's really not that difficult. And it all starts with this knowledge that God has saved you. You know, that Jesus movement that started in the day of Pentecost and has progressed through the history of the church continues to this day. The Lord is still filling people's hearts to speak about him. There's a passage of Scripture in the book of Acts in chapter 4 where the apostles Peter and John have been ordered to no longer speak in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they're actually being threatened. And so in Acts chapter 4, verses 19 and 20, um, Luke gives us the response of, of Peter and John. And it says, Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. We cannot help but do that. It just comes out naturally. It just happens because, well, the love of Christ constrains us. And even as Paul said, uh, woe unto me if I don't preach the gospel. You know, like Jeremiah said, when he said, uh, I had made up my mind not to speak any longer in his name, he said, but his word was, was in me like a fire. It was burning within me, and I had to speak. And so when the Lord is doing something in your life, when, when you and Jesus are tight in fellowship, when God is moving, you know what? You're going to sing praises to him. You're not going to have to have some cheerleader in, you know, like me as a preacher or a worship leader saying, come on now, come on now, I know you can sing, where are you? We're not going to need to do that. Listen, when the Lord is working inside of you, it's going to be a natural response. You want to sing praise to the Lord because he's been so good to you. That's what he's saying to us. Look at verses 4 through 6. He says, the Lord is great, greatly to be praised. He's to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. So all other so-called gods, he's saying, are nothing, because our God is master and our God is creator of all things. And as the Lord of all creation, he alone is worthy to be worshipped and to be praised. Isaiah 44, 24 says, Thus saith the Lord, your Redeemer, he who formed you from the womb, I am the Lord who makes all things, who stretches out the heavens all alone, who spreads abroad the earth by myself. And what are you saying, Lord? I'm saying, and I am worthy to be praised. I am worthy to be praised. And all these others that are being worshipped, these false gods are nothing. Because he's, he has, according to verse 6, he has honor, he has majesty, he has strength. And he has beauty that fills the temple, and it fills the temple because that's where he is. So, verse 7, give to the Lord, O kindreds of the peoples. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. And so we're called to not only sing praises and worship to God, we bring our offerings also to him. And we do that because we're grateful. We do that because we respond to what he has done in our lives. I've discovered once again that when, you are, uh, when you're in love with the Lord, well, there's nothing too great, nothing too great to do, nothing too hard to give when you're in love with him. 
And you do it voluntarily. You do it willingly. You do it because you like to. And so we're running around in Maui last week, and this week too. And as we're running around, we go to this particular store, my wife and I, and we're on, a, on the hunt because we can't go into stores that carry baby clothes without, without finding something for my grandson. And you know what? We did. We found him a real cool little, little shirt that he's going to wear as soon as I can get it on him. And, uh, and you know what? My daughter tells me today, my daughter Corinne, his mama says, you should have wrapped this up and give it to him for Christmas. I said, why? We're going to give him even more on Christmas. What does that matter? Anyway, he didn't know what it is. It's just, you know, it's something we enjoy giving to him. You know, my wife didn't have to say, now you better get him something. You know, oh, you know what, my honey, that's $8, man, you know. You know, oh, I wanted a cup of coffee. Uh, <laughs> she doesn't have to say that to me. She has to hold me back. You know why? Because I love that little guy, and I want to give him something. And you want to know something? I don't know about you, but, but that's how it is in your giving to the Lord. And some people, you know, come to church, and they think all churches ever talk about is giving, 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 as if they've never seen a commercial. You know, watch TV, and that's all you hear. You know, all through the weekend, you're being told to give your money to, to the great God Budweiser or, or whatever. I mean, you're constantly, and that's the funny thing, and I, I better be careful not to go off on this too long, but I will for a while because I, I want to. <laughs> but watch the weekend commercials, and they're filled with beer commercials, right? That's what you see, beer commercials and food commercials. You know, you have to get crazy chicken and you have to drink that, that, uh, that beer and all of that. And, and it's all weekend long. That's what you see, food, you know, and, and beer, food and beer, party and beer. And then, then watch TV during the week and they're telling you where you can go to rehab or lose weight. It's really interesting. So the, so the weekend is getting you drunk and then Monday you're having some show with a bunch of alcoholics, you know, and that's the truth. But everybody is trying to tell us to take our money and give it to Levi's and, and take our money and give it to these shoes or whatever because it's commercial. And so you come to church and you say, ah, oh, that's all you ever do is talk about money, which is not true at all. But in their mind, uh, what it is is the church is trying to take from them the money that they want to spend on El Pollo Loco or whatever else. And that's what's in their mind. They want to spend it on their clothes, you see. It's interesting, isn't it? But the Lord, when he's number one in your life, you want to give to him. You enjoy giving to him because it's an act of worship to him. And you can never outgive God. You can never give to him more than he gives in return. And so we give to the Lord out of a willing heart. Exodus 25, 2 says, Speak to the children of Israel that they bring me an offering. From everyone who gives it willingly with his heart, you shall take my offering. So we give to the Lord and, uh, because we love him. In verse 10, say to the nations, the Lord reigns. The world also is firmly established. It shall not be moved. He shall judge the peoples righteously. So believers proclaim that God is the creator, he's the ruler, and he's the sustainer of all things. And the one who sustains all things is also the judge. Verse 11 tells us that God is coming to judge. Now, it's interesting because that is something that he says ought to bring us joy. And Jesus is coming. And Jesus ultimately will judge the earth, and he does so through his message called the gospel. Romans 2.16 says that God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, Paul writing, saying, according to my gospel. Acts 17.31 says that God has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He's given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Now, notice in verse 11, the heavens rejoice, let the earth be glad, let the sea roar all its fullness, let the field be joyful, all that is in it. Then all the trees of the woods will rejoice before the Lord. He's coming, he's coming to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness, the peoples with his truth. And so the Lord's judgment is coming. It'll be poured out on all those who reject him. According to Romans chapter 8, verses 19 through 21, creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. 
For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. So the Lord is coming, and all creation is rejoicing in that because it no longer will be under the curse, and once again it will be free and will blossom. Psalm 97, the Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the multitude of isles be glad. Clouds and darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. A fire goes before him and burns up his enemies round about. His lightnings light the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. The heavens declare his righteousness, and all the people see his glory. Let all be put to shame who serve carved images, who boast of idols. Worship him, all you gods. Zion hears and is glad, and the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments, O Lord. For you, Lord, are most high above all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. You who love the Lord hate evil. He preserves the souls of his saints. He delivers them out of the hand of the wicked. Light is sown for the righteous and gladness for the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. So God rules, and I want you to see this in the first six verses. He's pointing out that God rules not just over Israel, but over the entire world because he created the whole world. And he says all the earth will, will tremble at his appearing. When he speaks concerning the clouds, in verse 2, clouds and darkness surrounding him, often clouds are a picture of judgment. And his, his rule is being pointed out as going forth in wrath against his enemies. Lightning flashes are terrifying the world. When you see about the mountains that basically are melting, he says, like wax, we need to remember that the mountains generally are thought of as permanent but even those are going to melt before him. So it's a beautiful picture of the judgment of the Lord and the glory that he has. It says let, in verse 1, let the multitude of the isles be glad. And that reminds me of the fact that every corner of the earth that God has called to himself is going to be glad when Jesus Christ comes. Well, in verse 7 he says, let all be put to shame who serve carved images, who boast of idols. Worship him, all you gods. Zion hears and is glad, and the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments, O Lord. For you, Lord, are most high above all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. So he's pointing out something very basic that we already understand. One is we know that when God gave his commandments to the nation of Israel in the book of Exodus, he said that he was the Lord, and they were to have no gods before him, and they were to have no idols. Idols are something that are vain. They're basically the, the work of man's hands. Isaiah, speaking about idols, speaks concerning the fact that somebody goes, cuts down a tree, and with a portion of the wood, he, he uses it as kindling so he can cook his meal. But in another portion, he takes it, plates it, places it up on a stand, and falls down before it and begins to worship it. And he says, with one portion, you cook your meal. The other portion, you worship it. And he says, and that's the foolishness of idolatry. An idol can do nothing to save you. It's just a work of, of man's hands. And so God is saying that all of the gods that are worshipped by the world uh, are, are false gods with no power to save. But he's saying, on the other hand, I am the one who rules all things, and I am the one that ought to be worshipped. And so, in verse 7, let all be put to shame who serve carved images. Because idols are useless, those who worship idols will ultimately be placed in a position of being put to shame. In Isaiah 44, 9 and 10, Isaiah says, Those who make an image, all of them are useless. Their precious things shall not profit. They are their own witnesses. They neither see nor know that they may be ashamed. Who would form a God or mold an image that profits him nothing? But there are so many who do worship idols. He's saying, I am the one who's to be worshipped. Now, verse 10 spoke to my heart today, and I want to share a few thoughts with you about this. Notice what it says. You who, now notice, you who love the Lord hate evil. That's a powerful statement. You who love the Lord hate evil. I looked up the word evil. I wanted to see what the Hebrew word means. What's the definition of that word? 
And the word evil in the Hebrew language is that which is hurtful, that which is bad, that which is vicious. It speaks of wickedness. And when you're in love with the Lord, then you're going to love, listen carefully, you are going to love the things that he loves, and you're going to hate the things that he hates. It's real basic, but that's where a lot of people are really blowing it today. They're trying to have just enough of the Lord to get into heaven, but they want the world because they enjoy it so much. They want to have heaven and the world at the same time. But Jesus said you can't. You have to make a choice. He said you have to either cling to me or forsake me. You can't have both at the same time. To love the world is to put you in the place of enmity or hostility to God because God hates evil. When a person commits their heart to Jesus Christ and you're freshly saved, you still have a lot of things within you that God wants to clean out. So what happens is you get into the Word of God. As you get into the Word of God, you begin to see the things that He likes and you begin to see the things that He hates. As a believer in the Lord, you begin to say, Lord, I want to cling to the things that you want me to have and I want to reject the things that you reject. And over time, you actually begin to mature and you begin to own those things. It's always a, a decision that you have to make. There's always opportunity for you to turn away from the Lord and to enjoy doing something that maybe you were saved from 10 years ago. And there are times when the stresses and the temptations are extremely strong. It's not always easy to turn your back on those things that used to have you captive. But because you're in love with the Lord and you want to do those things that are pleasing to Him, you make choices to die to those desires in order that he might rule and reign in your life. And as you do that over time, you begin to forsake more and more things that are not of him, and people begin to recognize you as maturing. And they'll say, there's something different about your life. You've grown. And that's what takes place as you grow over time. My wife, Marie, and I were speaking recently about this. I don't know if I've said this to you. But... Uh, and, and uh, forgive me if this doesn't really apply to some in here, but I, th I think it will to most of us who are married. You know, um, how do I put this so it makes sense? Well, I don't, so I'll just say it this way. The person that I am today, by and large, is the result of relationships. My relationship with the Lord my relationship with, with my family, my relationship with my children, but especially my relationship with my wife. Over the years, the Lord, through my relationship with Marie, has actually changed me because I respond to the person she is. And so, if I'd have married anybody else, I would not be the man I am today because Marie has caused certain responses in my life that have actually changed me as a man. Now, had I married a girl that I was in love with in high school, a girl who was extremely competitive, she, she would have brought out a competition in me that wasn't healthy. You see, my wife is the kind of person that, that isn't, isn't a competitive person whatsoever. She's very gracious, very kind, very laid back. She's just an entirely different person. And me, I'm extremely competitive. When I got hooked up with her, she actually began to work in my life a, a, a kind of a, a sanding of rough edges in me that actually made me a gentler, more compassionate, more caring kind of person. But what if I'd have married somebody that didn't have those kinds of traits? What if I married somebody who is also, you know, outspoken, also kind of like in your face, like I was when I first got saved? Then, then I... I, I I'd be just a really, I'd be Raul Reese. No, I'd be a really, <laughs> just an entirely different person. And the funny thing is, is Marie has become who she is because of the man she married. And so I have been used by the Lord to bring certain things out in her. Had she married somebody else, she wouldn't be the woman that all of us in this church who know my wife, she would not be that person because over the years, she has been shaped through relationship with somebody who loves her and is a certain person. 
Now, I'm saying all of that to say this. Sometimes people will say, I've committed my heart to Christ, but they're not in the Word, they're not in prayer, they're not in fellowship, and they're not changing because the Lord and they don't really have that kind of relationship. That's why you can see them three years from now, and they're the same person that you saw three years ago. They haven't changed, but you have. You have changed because you're in the Word, because you're in prayer, because you're actually doing the things that the Scripture says, and know you're not perfect, and know, you know you're nowhere near what you're going to be someday, but you're a lot different than you were three years ago, and that comes because of your fellowship with Christ. So how do we change? We change through God's Word. We change through fellowship with God's people. We change through fellowship with Jesus Christ through prayer and meditating on the Word of God and saying, Lord, what you say I will do. And God says, I like this. And so you say, well, Lord, I haven't learned to like that yet. I haven't learned how to forgive my enemies yet, and you like that. So can you teach me to do that? And, and, and Lord, your word says you hate, you hate alcoholism. You, hate, you, you, you say that those who are, are drunks aren't going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And Lord, you know that I've been drinking for a long time, but you hate that. I want to hate it too. And Lord, I don't want to be attracted to those things. I'm watching TV and, this, and a commercial comes on for a movie that I know is in hell. I don't want to be attracted to those things because I know you hate those things, you see. And that's something the Lord was speaking to me about today. You who love the Lord hate evil. Instead of playing with it, instead of being attracted to it, instead of getting as close to it as you can just to see as much as you can of it without falling back into it, he says, hate it, avoid it, stay away from it, regard it for what it is, because it's evil that Jesus Christ died on the cross to set you free from, you see. And uh, that's a very powerful thing that the Lord would have for us to understand today. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 12, verse 9, let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. And Psalm 119, 104 says, through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. I want to hate evil and I want to love you, Lord especially as I meditate on what put Jesus Christ on the cross and all that was done to him. Lord, may I not be the kind of person who enjoys those things anymore. So verse 10, you who love the Lord hate evil. He preserves the souls of his saints. He delivers them out of the hand of the wicked. Light is sown for the righteous, gladness for the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous. Give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. Light signifies the joy of redemption and victory in the Lord. And so he's simply saying to us that believers will rejoice as Jesus reigns and as Jesus rules. And finally, Psalm 98, sing to the Lord a new song. For he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained him the victory. The Lord has made known his salvation, his righteousness he has openly shown in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his mercy and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth in song, rejoice and sing praises. Sing to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of a psalm, with trumpets and the sound of a horn. Shout joyfully before the Lord, the King. Let the sea roar in all its fullness, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills be joyful together before the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. With righteousness he shall judge the world and the peoples with equity. And so finally, this psalm calls on the earth to praise God because of his marvelous works. His strength is revealed when he uses the word his hand in his right or his, his hand in his holy arm. That has provided salvation for those who have come to him. And verse 3 tells us that the salvation that we receive is based on his mercy and his faithfulness. You might find it interesting. The word mercy is the Hebrew word chesed. It speaks of God's covenant love towards us. It's similar to the concept of agape that we find in the New Testament. So he's saying salvation is based on God's love and God's faithfulness to us, and he's revealed that in salvation. 
verses 4 through 6 tell us to shout joyfully to the Lord uh, of all the earth. We're to, uh, to the Lord all the earth. We're to break forth in song and rejoice and sing praises. Keep this in mind, and this is something very basic. Keep it in mind, though, and it's something that will help all of us in this room. Worship very often as you praise God is exuberant. It's, 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 it's heartfelt, and, and, and it's okay to sing uh, as, as loudly as, as you feel comfortable singing. You know, um, I really think that we can be so excited about so many things, and, and sometimes we just fail to be excited about the right things. I've shared this with you recently. I think I was there in the Dodgers won uh, the first game of the World Series when they played Oakland, and, and Kirk Gibson got up. And I was at that, that uh, World Series game uh, back in, I think, 88 or 89, somewhere around there. It was a long time ago, as I recall. Uh, it's been a long time since we've been back, but that's another story. But I was there, and I was on the right field line, and when Gibson got up and he was going again against Eckersley, and it was a real tight battle and, and all of that, and, and there was, you know, two strikes, and we're expecting him to, 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 you know, fan. I mean, the guy's injured. There's nothing he can do. But there he goes, and he blasts a home run. And I'll never forget watching that ball as it traveled up the right field line. And there I am watching the ball as it goes past like that and drops itself right up into the, into the stands. And the whole place erupts. Everybody's on their feet, and everybody's cheering until you're hoarse. You can hardly even make any sounds. And it keeps going on and on, and it's reverberating through the stadium, and he runs around first base, and he pumps his arm, and everybody's just going, this is unbelievable. And everybody, you know, strangers are hugging, and it's just an amazing thing, you know. And it keeps on screaming and screaming and loud and loud, and it just doesn't stop. And so we're there for several minutes. And nobody wants to leave. And finally, my friend and I leave and go into the parking lot. And you can still hear the stadium as they're screaming and shouting and yelling. And, and it takes us time to get out. And people are waving at strangers like, oh, that was great, wasn't it? We became a fellowship for just a moment. And I thought about that. And I thought, how interesting, you know, that something like that draws strangers together to shout praises to a guy who didn't want to even play for the Dodgers the next year. Think about it. We get caught up with things that just don't matter. They just don't matter. They just, I'm not saying don't enjoy them. I wouldn't use that illustration if, if I didn't enjoy it. I thought that was great. That was, that was, it was wonderful. It was exciting. But it was 14 or 15 years ago, and it's over. Some people will work very hard for some kind of reward that is a right now kind of reward. They will work out for months and, and they will compete for years sometimes and they will compete in, in the Olympics and they get their, their medal. And that medal, from what I was told, the medal, the gold medal, is worth $110. It's made of about $110 worth of material. That's how much it's worth, $110. But they will work and work and work so they can have that medal, so they can stand on a stand, they can hear their national anthem, and people can cheer for them, and then their yesterday's news five years from now. And somebody can work and work and work so that he can set records, and your name will be put on a board, and people will look at your name there, and it says how high you jumped or how fast you ran or how many home runs you hit. But eventually, somebody is going to break that record. Your name's going to be removed from that board, and it's all a memory. And all the people who ever, ever remember, they become old and everything. They don't remember the details because that's yesterday's news. And people will get so caught up and excited about things that just don't matter, that really don't matter. What really matters, and you'll see this in eternity, what really matters is your relationship with God. What really matters is whether you've learned to love him or not, whether you actually can say to him in the confines of your own home or driving home in your car by yourself tonight, whether you could, with the radio off, just speak to the Lord and say, Father, I just want you to know something that I haven't said lately. I just want you to know how deeply I love you. I just want you to know how much I love you. 
So on Sunday, I'm doing a, a church service at the Grand Waialea in Maui. And there's 300 people, and I'm standing up there giving a study, and, and I'm thinking, and so I think out loud, and I say to them, you, you can't imagine, you know, how amazing it is for me to be where I am today knowing where I've come from. I'll tell my wife, Marie, hasn't God been exceptionally good to us? Hasn't he blessed us so much? Look around. You know, for me, I still, I mean, I walk into this room and I still blow my mind at what God has done. Because I remember a 23-year-old kid, one month past his 23rd birthday, sitting in a front room in Norwalk with a handful of people. I remember that kid because that was me, looking at a group of people, five or six, you know, 31 years ago, and just opening the word and saying, God is worth our worshiping because look at what Jesus Christ has done. So worship should be exuberant. It should be praise. I mean, if I can scream for a home run, why can't I sing a little louder for Jesus? If I can get excited about something like that, why can't I be excited about the fact that I'm going to heaven, that I'm going to be living in paradise with him for eternity? And so we worship the Lord openly, and we do worship him with exuberance and with our hearts. Psalm 47, 1 uh, says, clap your hands, all you people. Shout to God with a voice of triumph. Psalm 66, verse 1, make a joyful shout to God, all the earth. Psalm 95, verse 1, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Verse 7, let the sea roar in all its fullness, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills be joyful together before the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. With righteousness he shall judge the world and the peoples with equity or uprightness. So nature is called to join in the worship of God because God is coming to judge the earth with righteousness. And we look forward to his justice. We look forward to his judgment because we know that he has already dealt with our sin when we committed our hearts to Jesus Christ. And that's why with Paul we could say, uh, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. And so there's this thing in our hearts for those of us who know the Lord where we say, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. We long to see you. We long to be with you. We want to spend some time face-to-face -face with you. The day is going to come when we're, we're going to have the opportunity to look into the eyes of the one who wept for us and to say to him very simply, thank you and I love you. So I've been preparing for that now for 34 years, just waiting to be able to see him face-to-face, -face, just to tell him, Lord, you know, now I finally have a chance to look at you. And just to say those two words that, that I've been saying for a long time, but I've been practicing, I just want to say to you, thank you, thank you, thank you for what you've done for me. We shout unto the Lord with a voice of triumph.